Hello and welcome to this Total Education mini lecture on the characters of Frankenstein. In our last lecture we talked about the three main characters. We talked about Victor Frankenstein, we talked about his creation, and we also talked about uh, Walton. Tonight we're going to start focusing on some of the minor characters that add a bit of colour and flair to the story and contribute specific points that Shelley's trying to get across, especially about the values of the text. I'd like to talk about Henri Claval first. Henri was Victor's faithful friend. He's a, he's a contrast to Victor in many, many ways. Henri was a nurturing figure who, who doesn't ask for anything in return. We call him the, the faithful friend in inverted commas because that's what he is. He's not actually um, an outspoken character in many ways or, or a character that contributes much to, Henry, uh, to Victor's development and growth. And I'll talk about that in, when I criticise Henri's character a little bit later on. But first, let's look at his positives. The first positive, I suppose, is he's very unlike Victor in many ways, and as I said, he's used to it as a contrast. He's a humanities person rather than a science person, and we can see that Shelley's favouritism for what she likes comes in there very clearly. He moves away from science, and he moves away from the commerce of his father too, and, and we'll find, we find early in the novel that he's not allowed to go and study with Victor because his father was very focused on commerce, and Henri is a, a much gentler, broader sort of character. Um, Frankenstein says Henry is my better self, and that quote comes alerts readers to the fact that there is a connection between the two characters. He's steady and reliable, whereas Victor's not. He's a character that has no ego, and I think that's very important in, in a novel that has many, many egos, the three big egos that we talked about last night um, in our first lecture. He's inquisitive as Victor is, he's curious as Victor is, but he never gets that obsession, and I think that's very important that he never has that obsession. We find early in the novel on page 34, and I'm going to read this section to you tonight, because what we do is we find Elizabeth steers him in the right direction, and this is on page 34 of the text. And we see that she says, Yet he might not have been so perfectly humane, so thoughtful in his generosity, so full of kindness and tenderness amidst his passion for adventurous exploit. Had she not unfolded him the real loveliness of beneficence, and made the doing good the end and aim of his soaring ambition. And that just tells us very clearly that Henry is able to be manipulated and listens to advice from other people, and that's what happens not to Victor. Victor doesn't listen to anyone. He has that self-obsession. And he brings a real sense of calm to the novel. We see that Frankenstein mentioned several times through the text that when he sees Henri, he's very calm. And one good example of that is on page 62, and you'll find that where it says, he says, Henry, Henry is a faithful friend, a helper, and a healer. And that sense of calm is, is surrounds Henri all through the text. And that he's everything Victor isn't. Victor's full of passion and excitement and driven. And Henri's that calm, steady influence. He's genuinely and innately good. And he's the one character. He's like a touchstone for Frankenstein throughout the, the text. And... His death is, is very impactful. And, and I'd like to read this section to you again because it is very impactful on, on what happens and how Victor feels. He's genuinely shocked that, that Henri's dead and he, he realises that after he's destroyed the creation's mate, or whatever you like to call it, that Frank, the creation is on revenge and Henri is his first victim after that, just before Elizabeth. And we read on page 220... The examination, the presence of the magistrate and witnesses, passed like a dream from my memory when I saw the lifeless form of Henri Claval stretched before me. I gasped for breath, and throwing myself on the body, I exclaimed, Have my murderous machinations deprived you also, my dearest Henri, of life? Two I have already destroyed. Other victims await their destiny. But you, Claval, my friend, my benefactor. And then he collapses in convulsions. And that, that's one of the passionate reactions that Victor has, that he seems to collapse constantly. And Henri's always there to back him up and, and help him through and drag him away from the, the obsession that's his. But he's never strong enough a character to pull him completely out of that. And I think, and I've pointed out in my notes here, that Henri's flawed in one way, and that way is he's, he's never strong enough. 
He never confronts Victor about what's happening. When Victor comes to him with these impassioned moments and, and genuine um, horror stories, Omri sort of just accepts what's going on and never says, it's time to stop, you've done too much. And I think that's the, the flaw is he's too acquiescent to what goes on around him and he's too accepting of it and he's, he's probably too faithful. He's much like the, the Labrador puppy. But Omri does serve as a character that sets um, a nice contrast to Victor and probably more of the type of character that Shelley wants people to be, that, that sort of gentler, more understanding character. The next character we need to talk about is um, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth ends up Frankenstein, as she becomes. Along with Victor's mother seems to be, the, and Justine, the females in the thing, and we, in the novel, and, we, and we, we don't really get a strong feminine presence in the novel in, in any sense. And she becomes the touchstone for everything that happens. Victor's mother's a very loving and kind mother, but obviously she dies early. And Elizabeth epitomises the female values that were valued at that time. She's certainly perceived as an angel constantly. And you can read on pages 30 and 34 how angelic she is. And the descriptions that Shelley provides us cast her in that mould as angelic. And I'd like to read you one of those descriptions now from page 30, where early on it says, When my father returned from Milan, he found me playing in the hall of our villa, a child fairer than a pictured cherub, a creature who seemed to shed radiance from her looks and whose form and motions were lighter than the chamois of the hills. The idea of the cherub and the angel is constantly repeated when referring to Elizabeth throughout that text. And it, it's exemplified not just in her looks and the angelic looks that she has and the descriptions of her in that way, but also in the characteristics that she exhibits. For example, she's virtuous, extremely virtuous, she's very principled, she's honourable, she's patient, she's kind, she's loving, she's all those nice things that um, I suppose are womanly virtues in the old term and sense. And you've got to remember that we're talking here about the context of Shelley's time when women were seen in a particular way and role. And, and that context, of course, would then influence the, the novel. And it may be different from views people have these days. And you can certainly find these feminist readings of Frankenstein. And there's really, I don't think, much feminism in Frankenstein. And, and certainly the role of the women are, is very small and, and punctuated in, in, in one way. We see how principled she is, really, when we talk about Justine and Justine's defence. Elizabeth is the only person who really speaks out for Justine and, and makes a big thing of it and stands by her right to the very end. And in this, we see that Shelley describes her speech to the court and the judges and the, and the townspeople who are all there, that it was a heart, one of heart-rending eloquence. And it certainly speaks volumes for her character that she was one person who stood up and Frankenstein says, I should have spoken up and I could have spoken up, but he never does. He never tells the truth. He never tells the story as he sees it. And I think that's important because she does and she's that sort of moral code that Victor never has because of his obsessions and the way he sees the world and his own ego. And again, we see her light shine through on page 100. There's an excellent quote. Of course, for a good and virtuous creature, she has to come to a bad end. And she does. She's murdered horribly by the creature on her wedding night, as he has threatened to do to Victor months before. He follows them on their wedding night. He sneaks into her room, Victor's sitting up waiting for him to come. He knows he will come, but he doesn't come for Victor. He comes for her to torment and torture Victor even more. Her death is on page 245, and you need to read that section quite carefully to see the reaction of Victor to that. Um, her innocence becomes nearly a sacrifice for Victor's guilt, and, and that, that pure innocence that she has is completely taken away and removed and Victor's left with nothing after her death. She does raise issues of the role of women in the novel, and if you're looking for that feminist perspective, you'll find critics that talk about that sort of thing. For more for us and our study in this particular case, we're looking at 
what does she contribute? And we talk about the virtues and the patience and all those sorts of things that, that are very, very important. But we need to think about too, should she have confronted Victor? Much like Henri, she's very patient and virtuous, probably to a fault, and no one ever stands up to him, and she's in that role too. And we understand that from her character and her position in society. She was an orphan. She was sort of selected in many ways to be his wife and companion and comfort. That she doesn't stand up to him because she sees him more as, as a godlike figure that he tries to be, I suppose. But think again about the context. Go back to your context. Have a look at the context. Think about the role of women and, and even the other women, Frankenstein's mother and Justine in the novel and the sort of roles that they play. Um, if you're looking for a link to Henri, you could talk about the failure to confront and the niceness of benefit, and, and they both die. And I think that's an important point. There are other minor characters in the novel that probably need some form of discussion too. The other characters are certainly accompaniments to the main plot, but each teaches something, a little thing that Shelley's trying to get across a message or some didactic point. For example, a little vignette of the captain and the Russian lady at the start is just that pure romanticism with her poor lover and the true love and that, that pure romanticism is important because it sets a framework for the novel and it's in the early letters. In, con in contrast to that romantic ideal, we also have the professors and, and especially the professor Walderman who is Victor's um, sort of inspiration. He offers Victor unlimited powers and this excites Victor, Victor into being some sort of pioneer in the deepest mysteries of creation, as the novel says, and he spurs him on it, and Victor has this sense of his own great destiny, his own ability to create, and the ability to be, if you like, a god as he sees himself, and it proves, of course, him to be a false god. Probably one of the more interesting um, minor groups of characters are the De Lacy family, and I think we get a really good sense of who they are and what they are through the creation's uh, narrative. The De Lacy's are an old French family living in isolation, much like the creation, and he sees them and he sort of adopts them as a family. We have the old man, the blind old man. We have Felix, the son, and Agatha, his sister, and the old man's daughter. They're isolated in the forest, much as the creation is, and he learns much from them. He watches them, he learns, and he becomes sort of part of their family as an outsider. And probably, if we look at this family, it's the closest that they've ever become. Uh, the closest that the monster ever becomes to belonging to a family or being part of a family. And that's really important. Again, there's the romantic story of Safi and the family's um, downfall, that rural idol that... And in turn, the creation, when he attempts to make contact, is rejected by them, and his sense of belonging is completely and utterly destroyed by them. And this pushes the creation further into isolation. To conclude, we need to think about, and you should, if you want to delve further into the minor characters, you could also look at the townspeople and the sailors and the role of the judges, um, who beg the question, what is just? And Shelley works through them to, to look at that question. But I think we've covered mainly what we're here for tonight, so let's finish the lecture off. Thank you for listening to this Total Education mini lecture. We hope you enjoy it, and come back again to watch Total Education Media whenever you can. Subscribe to our site, you'll get these mini lectures for free. Good night.